Hello, hello. We are talking. Today is Wellness Wednesday. Happy January. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm well and yourself. I'm doing well. I'm so excited to have a conversation with you today about healing yes. for our Black children. Yes. So um, before we start, I just want to introduce myself to the people who do not know me. So my name is Geneva. Uh, I'm the founder of Where is Neva, a platform sh sharing, supporting, and inspiring our Black truth through storytelling. And we have this lady right here, this beautiful lady, who's going to talk to us about healing for our Black children and what that looks like. She is a mindfulness expert, edu um, mindfulness educator and consultant when it comes to children and even adults, correct? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So can you tell us a little bit of who you are and what you do? Yes. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, I am Dekeeper Crow, and I'm the CEO and founder of BC Royal Gems. And we are a wellness education consultant firm that really focuses on providing professional development, creative expressions, and some e-courses for schools and businesses that are impacting Black children and serving Black children. Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit about myself. Currently, I am still an educator. I teach mindfulness and yoga um, at the K-5 level, as well as I'm a mom, parent of my own two daughters. They have twin girls. They're 10 years old in fifth grade. Um, and just seeing them navigate things and me navigating this world as a Black woman myself and just how important it is to heal ourselves and to make sure that our kids, our future, right, they are prepared to be their whole selves and navigate yes. this world that we're living in. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. I love it. So before we get started into like the deep of our conversation, how did you get started in this work? Um, yes. So I've been teaching for about eight years now, and it was in about my third year of teaching, um, I had a, I experienced a mental health crisis where I was like, the stress of it was just getting to me. I also learned that um, stress manifests physically in my body. I would get aches and pains going to rheumatoid doctors and things like that. And like, oh, I just got this arthritis. And they were like, no, you know, um, blood work and everything's coming back normal. So I realized that then stress was just impacting. I was stressed about work and teaching. I had some family things that were going on. Um, and it was really just attacking my physical body. And then I realized that way I can kind of control this. So I got into mindfulness, began meditating, journaling, just kind of taking that healing journey within. And honestly, I was able to manifest a lot of things in my life. So I was like, oh, this works for me. I know it works for other people. So I got into, you know, learning more about mindfulness and yoga and meditation and things like that. And just to be transparent, it was like, I don't see a lot of people that look like me doing this. So it always mm -hmm. kind of felt like it was something that wasn't for me mm -hmm. um, until I experienced it myself, right? Because that, that representation matters. So that's how I kind of got into the journey. Wow. Wow. So what kept you going, feeling as if this wasn't for you, but you was like, I'm still going to do this? Um, that's interesting. I feel like I'm always a risk taker. So it's like, if it's something that I don't see or don't have available, I'm like, okay, I'm going to create that. That's one of my daily affirmations. I say that every day, write it almost every day. I create my reality. So it was like, if I don't see it, then I know that I can create it. And like I said, having daughters and just seeing them deal with certain little things. I say they're only 10, but you know, anxiety shows up for them. Um, some of that self-doubt and lack of confidence shows up for them. And just knowing that not only are they watching me and how I deal and navigate, but I want mm -hmm. them to be confident. And I know, like I said, I know the kids are watching. They they listen to a little bit of what we say, but they kind of model and repeat the things that they see us do. So I want to make sure that the legacy that I'm leaving is for my children to know how to take care of themselves and to do it radically, you know? I so, love yeah. it. I love it. So is this something that you were taught in your family or is this something you literally was like, like, where did you learn? I literally, um, I began the first, one of the first books I read was um, The Body Keeps Poor and just learning about how just any, really as Black people, right? Like 
trauma is in our DNA, it's in our genes, regardless of what we experience, let alone what we experience in, um, in our life and just realizing how that takes a up space in the body. So I read that book. Um, and then two years ago, I found this program called Brief for Change and it's uh, marketed towards educators, but it's a 200 hour yoga teacher training program. Um, so I'm like, okay, I was kind of using some of the mindfulness practices and movement practices in my classroom already. Right? So I was like, okay, I, I think I can get this yoga training. Um, and then it was just much more than that. So it, it deepened my self-study and I learned some other practices. Um, and then once I got in that journey, I continued my daily practice, meditation, journaling, yoga. Um, and then I decided to continue that and like keep this because like I said, that representation matters. Wow, I love it. Okay, risk taker and creating legacy not for yourself and for your children. That is amazing. So knowing this stuff, what made you start your consultation? I mean, yeah, what made you start your agency? Um, I've always wanted to have a business. I thought it would be more, I knew it was going to be an education because I'm an educator by heart. That's just kind of who I am. <laughs> But just the more and more being in schools and saying things that kids are experiencing. Um, I remember one time I went to a new school and I went in the middle of the school year. So they, the students, the staff weren't too um, used to me. And we were having a situation in the classroom and a student said to me, Miss Crow, you're not like the other teachers. You don't yell at us. And like for me, it was just like, OK, one, that's not normal. Right. Um, we don't have to yell at folks especially children, to get them to do the things that we need them to do. That's number one. Yes. And Wait, just say that one the, more time. One more time. We, we do not have, I don't even remember what I just said, we but do we, we, don't have, <laughs> we don't have to yell to get our point across. And I think a lot of times people forget that, like, period, right? People forget <laughs> that kids are people, you know? And I, I say this at the end of the day all the time. It's like, okay, if you are in the workplace with a colleague or you're at the bus stop or in the grocery store with somebody but how much is yelling at them really going to solve and it's like so why are we teaching our children that this is okay for them to be treated that way because my, my main thing is just like I'm thinking about 20 30 years from now when I'm a little bit older and I'm ready to retire I want to be able to sit back and be like okay the, the legacy is ready to take over but right now I don't feel confident about that Mm. Um, so just making sure that they're prepared and then exposing them to something else because there's so much stuff I've worked in charter schools and public schools and the difference in and the way children's bodies are are policed specifically black children a lot of things goes on in schools and kids don't even realize like you have a voice and you have a choice you have to learn how to Yes, you need to respect authority, but you can also challenge authority because unfortunately all adults are not steering you in the right direction and learning how to trust yourself. Like, you know what? Oh, my body is tensing up in this situation. Maybe this is not the best situation for me. Or, you know what? I feel my heart racing a little bit. So maybe I need to step back and then, you know, come to this with a level headed. So we don't make those little decisions that can get us in big trouble that yes, you yes. don't need to get in in the first place. I love it. I love it. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Your work is needed. I'm reading this book called All About Love by Bell Hooks. I'm not sure if you've read it. Oh, you have? have not, you not yet. Not yet. It's on okay. my list for next month. It's an incredible read. And she just talks about love and just loving a child and how we can get confused on care and love and how that's two different things. Um, and she talks about how we shouldn't be yelling at our children or even whipping our children, there's different ways around that without causing them harm. And so when I read it, I was just like, whew. And I just recently came to, like, the thought that where did we even learn about whipping our children? Where does that stem from? And if we really think about it, it stems from slavery and how they used to whip us. And so they felt that that was a way of discipline because that's something that they were, it happened to them. <laughs> we are teaching and it cycled down and cycled down and cycled down. So it's just like, when is enough enough? <laughs> you know, when do we put our foot down and say, I don't want, I want different. I don't want to have to whip my child to get my point across. I don't want to have to yell at my child to get my point across. And 
also doing that for yourself. So I love it. I love it. Is this hard work for you? Um, absolutely, because I think what you just said, right, is the first step. Um, you know, saying I do want different, but it's difficult to even know what that looks like or how to even get there when there's no one around you doing the same thing. Um, like for me, I have an amazing co-parent. My family um, is very supportive and the help when it comes to raising my children. I'm grateful for them. Um, but it, it's been a lot of courageous conversations. It's been a lot of setting some boundaries about just certain things that I'm doing that's differently in ways that um, we can respect that change, especially and the especially in the black community and i know that's like a huge a huge taboo topic right and i see some folks like in the comment mentioned in the bible you know spare the rod and things like that mm-hmm. um but it's just when you realize like i wouldn't want to be treated like that so it's, it's very difficult especially when you are used to that being your norm to step out and say oh well nah i'm not feeling this so i'm going to work and try to change it it's mm-hmm. it's definitely hard definitely difficult but I also think it, it's worth it because I, I just feel like as people everybody has their purpose and we have to lead in a way where it's like I'm making it better for the next generation that's coming behind me these are the things that I'm dealing with and I'm navigating but y'all gonna have y'all struggles too but this part of the struggle I want to help you have you know master that part so everything else mm. won't be as difficult and I just feel like that was a lot of what I didn't have so that's what I want to provide. Definitely. I love it. I love it. Um, last Wednesday, we featured a piece by this woman named Stacy, And her piece was called, What Happens in This House Stays in This House. And she talks about mm. what happened in her house and how, because of that tradition of what happens in the house stays in the house, nobody was talking about what was happening when it was things that were happening were bad. Um, and so she just talked about how she had to repair it herself so that she can be a better mother for her children. Um, and that's exactly what you're talking about. And what does that look like? And swallowing that pill and saying, hey, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I got to take responsibility. Absolutely. Like, I understand that's happened in my past, but so what can I do different? So repairing things, your inner child. What does that? What does that even mean? What is that? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Repair, because when you were saying that, the I can't remember who said it, but the quote is like, when you become a parent, like you're reparenting yourself, right? And it, I, I mean, it just it means a lot. But literally, really, just going back and looking at your childhood and realizing the things that maybe were traumatic for you, right? And, and you know, traumatic is just meaning anything that had gave us a high level of stress. That can be anything. That could be a separation. It could be violence. It, it could be anything, right? Um, it could just be growing up in the community that you grow in, up in, right? What you see when you walk outside your door in your neighborhood. Um, and so it, it's really difficult to do that. But just looking at it and just asking yourself, I believe it really comes down to two questions. One is like, well, what did I receive from my childhood, right? That's, that's helping me navigate what I'm navigating now. And then I think the second question really is, well, what do I feel like I missed from my childhood? And that's really mm-hmm. difficult. That's really difficult. And I've, I've had this battle just to be transparent because my parents were amazing. You know, I wouldn't be who I am now if it weren't for them. But there were some things that were difficult for me. Mm-hmm. Um, even now as an adult with children, it's like navigating certain experiences and certain memories that come up and trying to put those pieces together and then just knowing that, if I can answer those two questions, what did I receive that was good for me? And what were some of the things that I felt I didn't receive? Mm. And once you answer those two questions, just realizing, okay, well, how can I give that to myself now? Because even though we're in adult bodies, we're still children. That, that part of us is, is, is still there. And that's where that, you know, reparenting your inner child um, comes from because some of the things we might didn't get and some of the things we might have got too much of. So we just have to learn what, you know, go within and figure it out what it is that our inner child really needs and make sure that we give that to them and our adult body. Definitely. I agree. And I also want to, like, spread information that you can repair your inner child without being a parent. So, and that, <laughs> and that looks like, like you said, asking yourself, like, what is it that I used to love and joy to do that brought me joy as a child? 
And I had to sit back and ask myself, what was that? And I realized painting and drawing and being an artist allowed me to escape reality in that moment. It was my own meditation. And so art actually found me again during my depression. And it was like, Geneva, you need to go to Michael's and get you some art supplies. And so I started creating again. And also, I used to love riding my bike <laughs> when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And so I recently went to Walmart, got me a bike, and I've been riding around uh, my house. Yes. <laughs> so it's just I love asking it. yourself and be completely honest. Like, um, for me, it's like, when was my space to be away from everything and just be in my space? Um, and that allowed me to answer that question. And also, I'm a strong believer. You asking yourself those questions, you can find out what is your passion and your purpose. You know, when you sit with yourself and ask yourself, what brought me joy as a child that I love to do even when I was going through some hard times? Because as child children, there are times when we go through hard stuff that our parents didn't want to talk about, that we didn't want to talk about, that we couldn't even, we didn't know how to understand it. Um, and it's our job and our duty now so that we can understand it so we won't recycle that. We won't cycle this stuff over and over again. So, yes, answer your, ask yourself deep questions. <laughs> yes, really and I, I love the, the creative expressions, right? That art, that creative outlet. We got to do something to get it, to express it, get it out. Yes, yes. And art saves lives. I'm a firm believer. <laughs> that it does. Literally, that it does. If you guys have any questions, please, please, please ask away. Um, this is a really good conversation. Um, so how can we um, be advocates for our children, even if we're not educated? Oh, that's important. Um, you got to just listen to them. Um, and when they're not talking, create the space create a space where they can release whatever it is. Because I think a lot of times it's difficult to advocate for somebody when you don't know what they need. Mm -hmm. And then it's difficult, especially for children, because as, as adults, I feel we this is something we struggle with as well. But it's also difficult to advocate for help when you don't know what you need. So I, I think it's important to allow that space where children can express themselves, but also like get to know themselves. So know what they like and what they don't like. Um, and creating that space and listening to that. So when they need something, or well, the more we pay attention, sometimes we might can figure out what they need if they're not able to communicate that themselves. That is so important. I had a friend I was talking to, and she told me something that her parents used to do is that they would literally listen, not only actively listen, but watch you know, without even asking questions, just pay attention to your children. And she said her parents, like, would pay attention of how she used to collect rocks. And from that, she they brought her a, a rock polisher for Christmas, you know, to just inspire and see where that comes from. Um, and that's beautiful because you don't really see parents. I mean, maybe there's some parents that do that, but I don't know. In, in masses, do we do that? Do we foster... Yeah. Um, the things that our children like or do we have this idea of what we want our children to do or be and then we try to push them to do that instead of sitting back and watching you know like if your child loves to sing make sure like maybe get a karaoke set or something um, but there's different things that we can do to foster and advocate for our children and that's listening because we yeah. I don't know I don't know about you but I know, like, when I was growing up, I've always been told, like, stay out of grown folks' business. Stay, oh, you stay see, in the child's speak, place. Don't speak unless spoken to. We don't speak unless spoken to. And if you see something, you act like you didn't, right? <laughs> That's not okay. We got, mm -mm. we got to stop that. We got to stop that. I wrote a piece um, a few, the first Wednesday of this month. And it was, um, make sure you eat everything on your plate. And it talked about how that's something that was told in my family. And it, it cycled down um, to the point where I ended up losing my father to having a heart attack because of obesity. And we don't talk about how the things that we learn can ch like change and cycle over to something else, causing us our life. You know, so... That's true. It's so important to 
um, adjust our mindset to an abundance mindset and change our traditions and understand like some things that we learn isn't beneficial. It may have been beneficial then, and I talked about that as well. It's like my family grew up in the south of Alabama, and they were picking cotton and all this other stuff. So make sure you eat everything on your plate meant, meant something differently then than what it is today. It's like they may not have had enough, but now as we are getting more, we have to constantly adjust our mindset to abundance. And while we're doing that, we teach our children to do the same thing. Am I correct? I don't have any children. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, you're, I, I, I'm not in my head. Like, I, absolutely. Okay. It's, it's speci- especially the food thing. <laughs> yeah. Especially the food thing. Even, like, with my children, like, okay, we, we eat until we're full. Now, if you say you're going to eat something, and that's what you ask when you got, of course, yeah, I'm going to need you to eat that. But it just, just those those little things. And um, you were talking about what you said about your friend. I literally do that with my daughter. As I said, like this 10, I have 20 year old girls. The police team is real in this household. Um, so it's just like, you know, hey, we're going to set a minute. We're going to set a timer. How much time do you need? One minute, three minutes, five minutes. You just talk. I'm not going to say anything at all. You can say whatever, however, I won't respond at all. And I always give them the option at the end, like, okay, did you, did you wanted me to just listen or did you want feedback or advice? And sometimes they'll just walk away, like, here's my hug. That's all I needed. Thanks for listening. And then sometimes it's like, okay, well, yeah, I want some advice. Um, and that's difficult to do because I've never seen anybody do that. My mom would not wow. be that graceful um, with me. And, and it's different because, like I said, nobody else is doing it. So it feels weird. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know what, these changes, even though I might not be seeing it right now, I, at the end of the day, I want my daughter to be comfortable coming to mommy, even if you get in trouble. We're going to figure it out some way. We might be mad together. We might be upset. But we're going to figure it out um, together. And the same with before I became a mom with my niece and my nephew. They're in high school now. I feel the same way about them. So, like, any child in my life, especially as an educator, when we were in the building, you know, like, I want you to know, we, we can have this conversation. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about yourself. And I'm going to tell you if you need to improve on some things or if that was, you know. But at the end of the day, you're never wrong for feeling how you felt. Mm. And once we understand... Um, that like our feelings and our emotions, they're not us. They're just things that we experience and no emotion is going to last forever. So yeah. you, and I think a lot of times we, we get into like, oh, I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling that way and try to make it go away. No, you got to sit with it and feel and feel it and allow it to do what it needs to do. Cause it's just information. And that's, that's another reason why like mindfulness works for me because it's information. My body always gives me information, whatever I'm feeling whatever thoughts and emotions and it, it helps me go get to the root of it so that we can go past it that way you know those cycles right don't continue to repeat themselves i love it i love it how do you teach okay wait there's two things that you said that i really was like powerful first you said you don't offer advice unless you act that is freaking remarkable because as a parent isn't it something that you want to always advise your children? I want to solve all their problems, right? <laughs> I want to solve all, everything. But then it's like, okay, if I do that, you're not going to have that critical, those critical thinking skills for you to navigate yourself out of it. So I always kind of ask myself, okay, I want to make sure I'm giving you a tool that you can use in the event when I'm no longer here. You know, that, mm. that's, that's, that's my mindset with that. And, it, and it's hard to, to change our mindset. As you said that earlier, like it's, shift into an abundance mindset or you know a growth mindset and a lot of times as black people as black children right we are just trying to survive that's that's been our makeup we're very resilient we can get through anything but for me it's just like I don't want to just survive and get by I want to thrive and be prosperous okay. and, and and live life abundantly and have everything that I'm supposed to have so that's that's what like keeps me going and like checking that that inner critic that pops up when it does. Yes. Wow. So do you feel like when you ask your children questions instead of giving advice, do you think they are solving their own problems more easily? Easily? Um, to a degree. I don't think we're not 100% there yet, but I, I think it, it gives them the opportunity, like, um, let me see what, what tools I do have. Like, I know one of the big things, um, especially, like, when it's a test or something, the anxiety shoots through the roof. And it's like, well, what if I fail? What if I do this? I'm like, okay, let's, let's play that thought detective. What if this happens? Well, did you study? 
is this a real worry or is your, is your mind trying to play tricks on you right now? Um, and just kind of trying to give them those tools and that language to like really process that. Because the important, the most important conversations are the ones we have with ourselves. And sometimes that inner voice be doing some things that have you thinking some things that you don't really need to. So just knowing how to um, listen to that and how to redirect yeah. it when necessary. Wow, I love it. Yes, if you guys have any questions, please, please comment, ask away. I really admire that because it's needed and those skills are needed as an adult too. I mean, that's not something I was taught. So that's something I'm constantly teaching myself now, like asking yourself mm -hmm. those questions. So as they get older, it's just going to be so much easier. It's going to be so much easier and it's going to be so much easier for them to listen to their intuition and be super like assured with themselves like I can do this so that is so powerful that's so powerful um dang now I forgot the second part I wanted to say because I was just so <laughs> I was so yes um is there anything you want to talk about there's a whole bunch of stuff I can ask and talk I know. I just, one of the things, um, whether, you know, parents or educators or just anybody that has, you know, children in their life, like expose them to the mindfulness, expose them to meditation, moving their bodies. Most of our folks, we like to dance. We have rhythm in our bodies, right? Moving is important. Um, and then I want to just highlight about meditation. One of the biggest misconceptions were, for me was like, oh, I can't sit still because my mind is going to be racing. I have thoughts all over the place um but more so meditation is not just to sit still but just more so to observe and be aware of your thoughts and what's going on and just practicing practicing mm -hmm. that like if i always say if you can pray you can meditate so it's just really just observing what it is we might not physically be asking for anything other than clarity to see what it is that's going on right with ourselves because a lot of times the external stimuli um it interferes with that intuition and you got to know how to discern which is what so taking that time to self is just it's just so important i love it i love it so another thing because we talked about don't act don't speak unless you're spoken to so how do you feel about children asking you questions <laughs> Like, yeah, literally, questions that maybe you don't want to answer. How do you feel about that? So that that's funny because I get all the questions. <laughs> but I'm I'm a hundred percent transparent. Oh, uh, you sure? Are you sure you want to know the answer to that? Um, and then sometimes it sounds like I'm not ready to have that conversation. I need you to respect that boundary, depending on what it is. One of the main things that so pops wait, up that's is what um, you tell the, you tell your children that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even then, I, I hear them repeating it sometimes. Like, you know, they have their little sister issues. And it's like, um, can you can you respect my boundary right now? And in my head, I'm like, yes. <laughs> because that language is just not something that's common for us. But we need to learn how to say those in intimate relationships and professional relationships, right? We have to learn how to advocate for ourselves and set that tone. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Especially one thing that just popped in my head, of course, of course, is like uh, the birds and the bees, right? We had different exposures to that. However, that was explained to us. My children were probably, when they were talking, so holding conversations, so probably about three, four, five between that age, they knew like half a mommy, half a daddy come together to make a baby. We're, we're not going to have these conversations where you can misconstrue something and somebody mm -hmm. else can come in and give you information because we're going to get information especially now like i'm not even that old. i'm only in my early 30s but the access to technology that kids have now i didn't even have that so you're going to always have information coming towards you but you got to learn how to question it right how to yes. question that but I, yeah I'm, I'm real with them i'll say to them things that i would want them to say to somebody and i the things that i say to people like um yeah we can table this right now i'm not ready to have that conversation or maybe we can, you know, or you sure you want to have that answer to that question? But sometimes like, okay, dag, mom, that was too much. But hey, you add. Um, so, yeah. Are you acceptable to them saying that to you as well? 
Absolutely. It's hard. It's not easy, but absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, yeah, um, I just need a hug right now or, um, yep, I don't want to talk. I'm just going to go in my room right now. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to respect that, but I'm here. Wow. What? This is... This is like so different than what we did. <laughs> it, yeah, absolutely. And then it's like, I meant like I've had several, like I said, with my parents, because my parents, they grew up in North Carolina. They moved to the city. I live in DC. Um, my parents are in Maryland. Um, you know, they had big families, 12 plus siblings on both sides. It was, they grew up different, a lot differently um, than the way I want to raise my children, let alone the day and age. And I just think it's crazy because it's black folks, especially what happened a couple of weeks ago with the insurrection at the Capitol. It's just like so many things that we are still experiencing that if I were to talk to like one of my older aunts or uncles or my grandparents, if they were still living, they experienced some of those same things. The only difference is the, is the time, right? The date on the calendar. So we're still navigating some of the same things. Um, but we, we got to change with the time. We got to change with the time. So how do you have conversations like that with your children when it comes to race and politics? Um, it's very, it's, that's one of those things that are really difficult to navigate just as a parent, right? You want to keep your kids as innocent as possible for as long as possible. But at the same time, you know, they're going to see things, they're going to be exposed to things. So really, it's just like having open and honest conversations and letting them talk about however it is they feel. Um, like I said, we live in D.C. There, um, I'm, a, I'm an educator. Their dad is a police officer. So with a lot of stories with police brutality, we've had those conversations of bad police versus good police. And why would people do this? Or why would people do that? Um, and just allowing them to ask questions and allowing them to, yeah, like allowing them to ask questions and me being able to give them information as best as I can or maybe, you know, looking at a movie or reading something about it that would provide better insight for them but yes navigating those conversations are very difficult I love it I love it do you feel like yeah I can only can only imagine because having those conversations just even with family or even with yourself is hard it's hard like talking about Breonna Taylor or Sandra Bland or Tamar Rice okay and he was a child um right just having those conversations and sitting with that, it just I can only imagine how difficult it is to have those conversations with your children um, because you don't want that to ever be your child. But mm -hmm. it just, we don't know. And it's just like, dang. <laughs> and you don't want to instill fear into them, you know? But it's just like, this is a conversation that we have to have. Right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and it's been a conversation that we have to have for a long, 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 long time. So, yeah. Do you um, offer that with your consultations, too? Um, yeah. So any type of wellness workshop, even if it's just um, I even want to just know more about holistic wellness and what are some strategies I can incorporate or mm -hmm. even just how to have courageous conversations. And those are really important, but the opposite of that is having what I like to call compassionate conversations, right? And those are the conversations we have to have with ourselves. Sometimes we have those with other people, um, but just working through that and being able to have those different conversations and different practices, as well as yoga and meditation sessions. I love it. I love it. How do you feel about... Um, so we talked about meditating with your children and yoga with your children. How do you feel about affirmations? Um, every single day. <laughs> every single day. Um, we write, I have a practice where I write my intentions and affirmations for the day. And I have, I made, I'm a creator. So like, I, I love to create. Michael's is my store too. Um, so we made these uh, affirmation cards and affirmation mirrors. So Sometimes we can just go in the, they can just go in the jar if they can't come up with one on their own and they can just choose one. So it might say, I am strong or challenges help my brain grow or I'm intelligent. Um, I learn from my mistakes, things like that. And then I ask them, okay, throughout the day, what was your affirmation this morning? What was your intention for the day? And then when we have those moments during the day, like repeat those things to yourself. And for me, the way I differentiate between 
affirmations and intentions. Affirmations are just things that we know are already true about ourselves, but we say them to remind ourselves. Um, and I do that with my students in class every day. That's a, the first part of our class. We say our affirmations. And then where I differentiate is the intention is the commitment to action behind it. So even when it's like I'm not feeling strong or if I'm not feeling beautiful or intelligent, what actions can I take throughout that day um, to, to help reach that point? I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, do you feel like, well, I feel like the importance of affirmations with Black children are important regardless of it being a little girl or a little boy. Um, but I know with being a woman, um, and I know as a little girl, some affirmations would have been something that would have helped me a lot when I was a child. Um, so I, I find it very powerful that you're doing that with your daughters. And not only your daughters, your students. That is needed. That's needed. Um, yes. Does, if you all have any questions or anything, I haven't seen any questions. I appreciate the love for our locks. Yes, it's two <laughs> <laughs> women with locks on here. Um, if you have any questions, please, please. Um, ask away. We are definitely talking about healing for our Black children and what does that look like um, in the power of doing so because we have a lot of work to do, family. Regardless of, of who's in office, we still got work to do. We still got Absolutely. work to do. And we have to understand our responsibility in it. We have to do what we can for ourselves so that we can do that for our children and beyond. So Yes, yes, yes. Um, do, do you have anything you would you like to mention? I feel like that's I've asked a lot of my questions. <laughs> yes, um, I feel like we pretty we pretty covered it all. Yes, I love it. Okay, okay. I'm trying to think. I really love how we talked about just reparenting your inner child and doing that for our children. Um, what's your favorite? yoga moves with your children or even do you do it with your students as well um yeah i do it with my students at school um my daughters they they're some timey when it gets when it comes time to get involved in the yoga the physical aspect of it they like to come bother me when i'm on the mat so <laughs> well um usually when i'm doing like a downward dog or like a um wheel pose they like to either come and get under me and like match that same move. So it's like, okay, y'all really testing this strength and confidence right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Is there any apps that you, or you just um, listen to your body and move? Um, I pretty much create everything that I do. Um, I, for, my, for my school, there is a curriculum that I'm using called Pure Edge. It's a free resource. Um, and they have mindfulness lessons available um, for folks to use and it's for school age children so they have like a K through 12 it's broken down in three parts curriculum um, so per edge is a really good resource and then of course DC edge? William Jones yep it's called pure edge. Oh, pure edge okay yep pure edge I love it I love it I know I use um, in a yoga app called down dog and it's, it's really, really good. And that's something that you definitely can do with your children, too. You can do, like, the beginning stage and mm -hmm. have them watch the woman on the um, screen and do it with them. So I think that is very important. Yes, move your body with your children. I love it. I love it. Well, that's all I have for you. I'm so appreciated for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can find her on whereisneva.com under the mental pillar. Um, can you tell us once again what you do so we can wrap up the call? Yes. So at DC Royal Gems, we're focusing on building up our black children to live and embrace their and be and live an empowered life through mindfulness and yoga. So we offer one-on-one -on -one consultations for just black folks on their holistic journey, as well as wellness workshops and mindfulness and yoga sessions for schools and businesses that are serving black children. 
Yes, yes, I love it. I love it. We are doing this, okay, family. We are constantly healing. It is our legacy. We are creating different. <laughs> we're doing different things so we can continue to leave a foundation for our children's children and our children's children and beyond. And we're not only doing it for that, but we're doing it for our ancestors as well. So thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. Um, you are fully. We appreciate you. Continue to do it. Continue. Thank you. Um, yes, you once again you can check her out on wearsneva.com under the mental pillar um, of our support system. Next Wednesday we have another Wellness Wednesday, so catch us there. I will be posting that information very soon. So thank you again for your time, and it was a pleasure talking to you. All right, thank you. Thank you have you. a good one. Keep doing what you're doing too. Thank you. You as well. Bye. Bye-bye.